No? Okay. Now, better? Everybody can hear? Good. Okay. <clears throat> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وتقا وهدى يا أرحم الراحمين فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وإن خير الهدي هدي نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So inshallah we're back with the stories of the prophets each Saturday back again with this series and last time we left at Prophet Ayyub عليه السلام right we talked about sabr and the importance of sabr and it was really a good thing, right? Because Ramadan was there and we all had to do sabr and patience. So I hope everybody's Ramadan was well, inshallah, right? Did we have a good time in Ramadan? Fasting and praying, inshallah. So today, another moral story. We're going to have three stories, not one story. It's short, don't worry. Um, but another moral story today. And it is going to be the story of the people of Median. Have you heard about the city of Median before? Anybody heard about the city of Median? Okay, you did? Okay, so let's look at the map over here. In this map, at the laser point over here, there is a city called Ma'an in Jordan modern-day Jordan, right? And just a little bit away from it, as we are approaching uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, there is a city called Al Bida in modern-day Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 35 kilometers away from the city is the city of Median. It's not a city, really. It's a village, village of Median. And this whole land, from the land of, or the city of Ma'an, till the village of Median, this whole land was called the land of Ma'an back then. And we're talking about back then, we're talking about the era of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, where does the word Median come from? Why was it called Median, right? Each, each city, each country in the world, there's a reason for its name, right? America is called America because there was a very famous Italian uh, sailor man who sailed to the New World. He was named, uh, his name was Americo, right? So they called it America, right? <laughs> Same thing with Median. It was named after a person. If we remember when we talked about the story of, of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had four wives, right? He had Sarah, who was Babylonian. She was his cousin. He had Hajar who was an Egyptian princess. He had Qattura, who was a Can'ani uh, princess. People don't know where's Can'an. Can'an is mo in modern day Palestine. May inshallah Allah liberate Palestine. And his fourth wife, her name is Hajron. She was also Can'ani. From each wife, he got children, right? So from Sarah, we know he had Ishaq alayhi salam. From Hajar, he had Ismail alayhi salam, right? The progenitor of the Arabs, the, descend, uh, the ancestor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the, from Qattura, he had around six children. One of these children, or two of them, there was Median and Median. Median and Median. So these guys, they decided they want to live in this land, the land of Ma'an. They brought their wives, and they brought their children, and they lived over here. So where did everybody go, right, from the descendants of Ibrahim? So let's probably, let's try to re revise that a little bit. Okay. So if you look at the map, do we know what this land is? 
Anybody knows? Yeah. Yemen, right? Yemen. Okay. So the east part of Yemen is called the region of Hadramaut. In this part is the city of Al Ahqaf. We talked about that, right? Who was the prophet for the city of Ahqaf? Hud alayhi salam. Hud had two children. He had Al Qasim or Falag, and Falag is a Hebrew word, right? Which means well, Falak, right? What does Falak mean in Arabic? Somebody who spreads something, uh, separated something into two parts, right? Qasim means somebody who separated something into two parts. So his name was Falak, uh, sorry, Qasim. And another child, his name was Qahtan. Now Qahtan said, I'm gonna stay in Yemen, right? Life is good here, I have a good business, right? My family's happy, so why, why immigrate? But Falak or Qasim said, I want to leave. I want to have my own empire, right? So he immigrated all the way through the Arabian Peninsula's desert and reached southern of Mesopotamia. Why? Because southern of Mesopotamia, we had two rivers there, Dijla and Furat, right? The Tigris and the Ephrates. And for those who don't know, those two rivers are one of two rivers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended directly from heaven into earth. So they settled there, and there, there were a bunch of people. Inshallah, at the end of the lecture, we're going to talk about the whole family tree of nations thing, inshallah. So we're going to get in depth for that. But there were a bunch of people living around here from the descendants of Nuh. And one of these guys was who the Namrud, right? Remember? And there we had the civilization of the Sumerians. So Falak's descendants and children they would intermix with the Sumerians. They would become part of the Sumerian Empire. The Sumerian Empire is the most ancient known civilization in history, in written history, at least. Of course, there were civilization before it, but this is the written one, the one that we have record, rec records about it. And from the descendants of Falak, or Al-Qasim, came Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we said how Ibrahim married his cousin, Sarah, whose father was the prince of Harran, northern part of Syria. And then, because of everything that happened with Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had to immigrate from uh, Mesopotamia, or modern-day Iraq, to Syria, and he went to Halab. Why is it called Halab? You know the full name of the city? It's Halab al-Shahba. Al-Shahba is the name of the cow of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So what happened is he stopped there and he milked his cow because he wanted to get milk from it. So they said Halab al-Shahba over here. So it was called Halab, Aleppo. And from here, he went to Damascus, right? And we talked about who built Damascus, Sam, the son of Nuh alayhi salam, right? This is why it's called Sham, because in the Semitic languages, Sin and Sheen would take places. So sometimes they would say Sam, sometimes they would say Sham. This is, what, this is why it's called Sham. And then he went to Philistine, and then when he went to Philistine, the drought happened, and then he had to go to Egypt. And there, he met with his wife, Hajar. They went back to Philistine again, and then the very famous incident of Hadr leaving to Mecca occurred. So after Sarah's death, he had to marry another two wives, right? And he got the other children. So when Ibrahim died, his children, they did not want to stay in one land together, right? It was getting overpopulated. So they decided they want to scatter around. So all of his children scattered all around the Arabian Peninsula and Syria and Iraq. And they had different civilizations. And one of these is Median. Okay. Now, what's the problem with the people of Median? Every single nation, they're living in peace, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a prophet. There's a reason for this prophet to be there, right? If, let's say, if somebody is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very peacefully, they're being just, justful, not doing anything, any acts of injustice, Right? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send 
somebody to correct them or guide them, right? They don't need any correction or guidance. So what was the problem of the, these guys? These guys, if somebody or like a caravan or someone was crossing their land, the land of Ma'an, they would get out of the city, they would stop this caravan, they would have their weapons out, they would threaten them. If they don't give them what they have, they are going to kill them. Now in Arabic, we call this qat'u tariq. There is a term for it in English. I'm trying to remember it. I think it was, uh, was it ban ban bandits. bandits, right, bandits. Yeah, so bandits, they were bandits basically, banditry, they committed banditry. That's one. This is an act of injustice, right? In, I mean, in our modern standards, right? Is that good or bad? That's bad, right? That's one. Now, when they get this, those things, those, you know, money and all of that, you know, clothes, whatever merchandise they get, they would go back to their land and they would start selling it, right? They had businesses, they were traders, merchants. Now here's the second problem in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about in Surah Al-Mutaffifin. They used to do an act in Arabic, we would say, يَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ يَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ What does that mean? All right. Say you come over to me and you want to buy something from me. All right. Let's say you want to buy a bunch of fruits, right? So I would balance these fruits for you. So how many pounds is it? That's how much money it's gonna cost you, right? Let's say 10 pounds, it's gonna be $10, right? So they want it to get a very high price for a very low product. So what they would do is they would cheat and they would play with the balance. So it should be 10 pounds, but then they would corrupt the balances and make it seem like it was three pounds. So now they have to pay $10 for three pounds because the, the amount, the quality is 10 pounds, right? But the balance is saying it's three pounds, does not make any sense, but the quality is, is equal to $10. So you have to pay me $10. So, so they were cheating. Now let's say somebody wanted to sell them, sell them something they would do the same thing. They would make the balance go up as if this, pri if this product, the price of this product should be high. Now you have to pay me a lot. So that's cheating on people. It's an unjustful act. And the third and big thing and uh, unfortunately the thing that reflects sinning. When you sin a lot, you get driven away by sinning that you start getting ignorant. You start not acknowledging knowledge, right? So you start doing ridiculous things. And this is what exactly they did. They were worshiping a tree in their land. Imagine you're walking and you see a tree and you see people around it starting to like bow for this tree and think this is God. This is what they, they were doing. They were bowing to the tree thinking this is God. They would cry in front of the tree. They would say, oh Lord, save me. Not to the Lord up there, no, to the tree in front of them. All right, so this tree is, comes from the, um, the wood of al aik So it was called uh, al aika And hence their name is Ashabu al aika The people of al aika So that's another name for the people of Median, the people of Aika, because they worshiped the tree of Aika. So all of this was happening, all right? Now we need somebody to correct all of this, right? I don't think you're gonna appreciate somebody wasting his lifetime worshiping a rock or a plant, right? You gotta talk to him about it, right? People would pro like, I mean, obviously if you, if you do this, what would people think about you? You have a mental illness, right? You're worshiping a tree, <laughs> right? <laughs> you need to be taken somewhere, you need help. So, <laughs> so Shu'aib wanted to help them out, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Shu'aib, he revealed to him, he told, he told him, 
go and preach for your people, there is only one God, and tell them to stop cheating on others. Tell them to stop taking the rights of others. They're taking the rights of others. My right is that if I, if I need to buy this pro uh, product, I need to buy it by the same price it should be. Not by the price, the imaginary price that you're telling me. You're taking my rights away. So it's not just only, you know, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also to establish rights for humanity. This is what Islam is concerned about. Islam is not concerned about only worshiping Allah. Worshiping Allah is the root of good. Worshiping Allah will automatically set you on the right path. But what, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned with for humanity, for them to respect the level and the rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gave them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, He created Adam with His own hands, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. With His own hands. His soul was created with His own hands. So Adam's, Adam's level and rank and his descendants is very huge, it's very high. So we need to respect that. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worried about. And as I said before, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create humans in the first place? Why were we crea created? Does anybody... Um, yeah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but why? He could have... He doesn't need to be worshipped, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ghaniyun anil alameen. Why did He create us? Yeah, but why? Still, He, he doesn't need anybody to test. Think about this. An artist, why does he draw something? It's inspiring, right? <laughs> it's inspiring. What, why else? Because he loves what he draws. He had an idea. He said, I want to draw something I had in my imagination. I really love this. I want it to come to reality. So he draws the artwork and he loves it. Artists, you got to see that. They love what they do. They love the art they create. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us because He loves us. He wants us to exist, mainly. And I mean, obviously, if somebody created you, you're not going to worship somebody from your imagination, right? You're going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you. Why? Because He blessed you. He gave you this blessing that you exist in the first place. He gave you this blessing. So you need to thank Him. Say, thank you. I, you created me. You're the reason why I exist. So this is the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been sending to all humanity. And in this case, that's the message. Right? You need to be respectful to yourself and to other humans and deliver rights for other people and not take rights away. So Shu'aib, this is exactly what's the message. The whole thing that I told you right now, that was the message of Shu'aib. This is what he would tell him, tell them. Now what's the response? What's the response of his people? Let's look at the eyes. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإلى مدينة أخاهم شعيبا قال يا قوم اعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره قد جاءتكم بينة من ربكم فأوفوا الكيل والميزان ولا تبخسوا الناس أشياءهم ولا تفسدوا في الأرض بعد إصلاحها ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين ولا تقعدوا بكل صراط توعدون وتصدون عن سبيل الله من آمن به وتبغونها عوجا واذكروا إذ كنتم قليلا فكثركم وانظروا كيف كان عاقبة المفسدين right he's reminding them remember what happened to the corrupted people before you so do not corrupt in the land after it was fixed after Ibrahim عليه السلام came over and fixed what others has corrupted do not corrupt in the land again but what did they say قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه استكبروا they were arrogant the people who were arrogant those are the ones who responded to him and arrogance is a big problem if we go way back to the first lecture when we talked about Adam what was the first test for all creatures what was the very first test for all creatures was it the tree test in which Adam alayhi salam were asked, was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to eat from the tree no the first test was the test of bowing when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Iblis bow to Adam that was the first test because here 
you are challenged with your own internal desires. We always hear this, oh, do not let the shaitan do this to you. Do not let the shaitan do this to you, right? Don't follow shaitan. Well, yeah, shaitan is a problem, but the reason why you follow shaitan is because you let yourself follow shaitan. If you block the path, if you block the door in shaitan, he's not going to get inside and you're not going to fall for his tricks. So you need to fix yourself. Iblis was tested with himself and he was arrogant. He did not block himself from sinning. He did not block himself from being arrogant and he fell for that. And again, humanity followed upon this unfortunately, right? So the people of Median fell with the problem of arrogance. And with all arrogance, they said, we will get, kick you out of our village and we will kick out those who believed in you or you will come back to us and follow our religion and do what we do. Banditry and, um, you know, بخسناس أشياءهم to play with the balances. So, Shu'aib here, he, he told them, قَدْ افْتَرَيْنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا إِنْ عُدْنَا فِي مِلَّتِكُمْ بَعْدَ إِذْ نَجَّانَ اللَّهُ مِنْهَا وَمَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنْ نَعُودَ فِيهَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّنَا وَسِعَ رَبُّنَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا عَلَى اللَّهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ He told them, we, we can't go back. You don't understand the problem here. The problem here, we are enlightened now. We are liberated. Our mind and souls are liberated. We know the right path. We can't go back to whatever you guys are doing because whatever you're doing, you guys are slaving, or you guys are enslaving yourselves. You guys are slaves to yourselves. You are in prison. We can't go back. We're sorry. So they forced them. The people of Median, they forced Shu'aib and his followers to go back to what they're worshiping and to do what they were doing. They were torturing them. They would literally take out their swords and say, if you don't do it, we're going to kill you. So these people were forced to do the practices and they did not like it. They did not enjoy it. So what, they did, what did they also tell Shu'aib? قال الملأ الذين كفروا من قومه لئن اتبعتم شعيبا إنكم إذا لخاسرون. They started using this type of rhetoric, right? You guys, if you're following Shu'aib, you guys are not going to get money. You guys are not going to have good businesses and good lives. So, I mean, they're getting a lot of money, right? They're getting a lot of money, but the Prophet ﷺ said. It is better for you to get few money halal and not get this money from haram. You may get a lot of money from haram, right, from haram practice, but trust me, if you get a little bit of money from halal practice, at the, at the end, eventually, you're going to get a lot of money because the money you get from halal practice, this money is blessed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with what you're doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith that was said by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when a human is in his mother's insides right before he gets born Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes if he is going to ha have a good life or a bad life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also writes what his rizq the money he's going to get so no matter what you do in your life no matter how much you're going to work, you're always going to get the amount of money Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already said you're going to get. So if you have a robber who goes to rob a bank, for instance, from this robbery he's going to get $1 million. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written that this man is going to get $1 million for sure. Now you're left with a choice. You want to get those $1 million by doing good things, by working hard, you know, studying and then working doctor engineer teacher whatever and then getting this amount or by doing a haram thing stealing you are left with those two choices so we really don't need to be concerned about this this problem there is an ather that says yabna adam ma khalaqtuka litalab wa katabtu laka rizqaka fala tatab 
right? I did not create you to play around. And I've written what you're going to get, so don't be tired. And this ether, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no matter how much you can run in order to get what you want, how much money you want, how much you know, wealth you want, I will still give you what I've written to you, no matter what. If you're going to work so much hard, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I'm going to give you just $100 in your whole, whole entire life, you're still going to get $100. That's it. No matter what you do. So these guys did not understand this aspect. They, they did not as, understand this concept. They thought they were having a happy life. They're wealthy. But the people of Shu'aib understood the concept. So they refused. So what happened eventually? After all of this, all of this, these arguments that Shu'aib and his people had with the ones who did not follow Shu'aib. What was the outcome of this? They made fun of Shu'aib. They mocked him, tortured him and his people. And they said, you know, we really don't understand what you're talking about. Literally, this is what they said. Remember when I, when I said, Sinning makes you ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kalla bal rana ala qulubihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a sort of a barrier on their heart that they cannot understand no more. They're, they're not going to have any sympathy to what you're saying. So their minds are blocked. They don't understand what Shu'aib is saying no more. So they would make fun of him instead. We see this in our daily lives, right? When you're arguing with someone and he does not understand what you're saying, so he makes fun of you, right? This is exactly what they did. And then he was a man who was blind. Shu'aib was a blind man. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa says in the Quran that they told him, وَمَا نَرَاكَ إِلَّا ضَعِيفًا بَيْنَنَا right? فيما معنى الآية. You, are, you are weak among us. He was a blind man. The story of his blindness is said that he used to cry a lot for the love of Allah because he loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he would cry so he he's became blind so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked tribe he said why did you cry is it because you were scared of hell or is it because you miss heavens you want to go to heavens and he said oh Allah no I did not cry because of neither I, I'm crying because I love you so Allah said I will allow you to see my face on the day of judgment. You will be given this rank. You will see me. This is what he told him. This is a hadith by the Prophet Sallallahu And not just that, he told him, in this dunya, I will give you Musa ibn Imran to be your servant. Do we all know who's Musa ibn Imran? Musa, Moses, the Prophet. So imagine his rank and level in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave. He's letting a prophet, one of the greatest prophet in history, one of ulul azm, min al-rusul, work as a servant for him. Imagine this. So he has a great level. So now his people is making fun of this man. Imagine this. This man is being made fun of. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Let's imagine this together. Do we remember last week? What was the, uh, the weather like last week, in the beginning of the week? It was really hot, right? Were we able to sleep these nights? We would be sweating and not be able to sleep. Even if we would drink how many gallons of water, we still, it's hot, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for seven days, He sent on them a very, 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 very hot weather. No matter how much water they drink, no matter what they do, it's not going to help. Because with this hot weather, he stopped the wind from coming to their city. So no, no wind would come to their city to like cool it a little bit. So one day, after those seven days, a huge cloud would come over their city. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell Shraib, um, leave this city. You and your people, leave it. And then they would look at the cloud, they say, oh my God. Finally, yes, we're going to have some water and some shade. This day is called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yawm al 
Because they would go to the cloud, they would go to the cloud, they would stand beneath the cloud because they want to get some shade. And then suddenly, lightning strikes on them from everywhere. And they start seeing each other, they're dying. Lightning is striking them. Not just this. They want to run away now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the ground, have an earthquake. So now there's an earthquake beneath them. So there's lightning above and an earthquake. So there are people start, starting to get away. So Jibreel descended and he held the ground and he screamed. Sayha. This scream killed them all. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجْفَ فَأَصْبَحُوا فِي دَارِهِمْ جَاثِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended the punishment upon them and they became just like statues. They're like standing and they're very shocked. If you don't believe me, there is a city in Italy. It's called Pompeii. This city, they were sinners. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended a punishment upon them and فَأَصْبَحُوا فِي دَارِهِمْ جَاثِمِينَ You can see it, Google, Google this. You can see their corpses. Their corpses are literally statues. Statues, and you can see their facial expressions and everything. Till this day, from 72, BC, uh, 72 after Christ born, after Christ was born, until this day, their corpses is like that. So those people, the same thing. After that, Shu'aib and his people, they went to Mecca. And they lived there and they died there. And their graves is between Dar al Nadwa and Dar Bani Sahm. Dar al Nadwa was a building they constructed. It was constructed, I believe, by, um, I think it was Hashim, uh, Hashim ibn Abd Manaf, the, the ancestor of the Prophet, or either Qusay ibn Kilab, another ancestor of the Prophet, in Quraysh, in, by Quraysh, generally in Mecca, in order to discuss, you know, the politics and the trading and all of that. And Dar Bani Sahm, there is a, uh, a clan in the tribe of Quraysh. It's known as Banu Sahm. This is where they used to live. So in Arabic, back then, if somebody or a tribe or a place, they would live there, right? They would call it Dar Bani Sahm, for instance. So today we have a city in Turkey. It's called Diyar Bikr because there was a tribe. They were known as Bikr, Bikr ibn Wa'il. They lived there. So the Arabs would call them Diyar Bikr, the place where Bikr lives. And tribe, he turned back on his people, on the city where his people were, and he said, فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ وَقَالْ يَا قَوْمِ لَقَدْ أَبْلَغْتُكُمْ رِسَالَاتِ رَبِّي وَنَصَحْتُ لَكُمْ فَكَيْفَ آسَى عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ كَافِرِينَ I have told you the message. I have argued with you, logically. Why would you think I would be sad about you? I gave you all the choices and chances. I spoke logic with you. And that was your fate. Very unfortunate. And unfortunately, this is the unfortunate fate of those who does not use their minds. And the Quran is here for us to use our minds. I've said it yesterday for those people who was with me in the lecture. And I said, the Quran, everything is derived from the Quran. Everything. And this book did not come just for us to read it and that's it. If you read Al-Quran, memorize it, you're automatically set with rhetoric and logic. You're automatically set with argument. SubhanAllah, because the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, it's logically organized. SubhanAllah. Just as a fun fact, what did I tell them yesterday is, you know your video games and iPads that you play your video games with, right? That you love very much. So there is a man by the name of Al-Khawarizmi in the medieval times, right? He lived in the medieval times. So we have inheritance laws in the Quran. So if somebody dies and he has properties, this property needs to be distributed, right? We're familiar with that. So this man said, these are very complicated. I would love to have some sort of things to organize it. So he started thinking. So he said, okay, we might have an equation. And if x plus 1 equals that, then what is x? So he created what we know as what? 
algebra, right? We hate algebra, right? <laughs> so he created algebra, right? Pray for this man. I know he created your misery, but <laughs> pray, with him, pray for him. This man created this science that they use today in order for them to invent computers, laptops, iPads, your video game console that you really like, right? So without the inspiration he got from the Quran, you would have not had iPads. You would have not had any electronic devices. So do you see the power of Quran? So let's move to the next story. This is a beautiful story. In the land of Azerbaijan. Do we know the land of Azerbaijan? I think, I don't know if we can see it here. All right, can you see the map? Okay, so let's go up north over here. There is a country known as Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. In this land, there was a well, and there were a nation who lived around this well. And they had a king. This king was very justful, and they loved him, and, they, and he loved them, right? Mutual love. So, this man died, the king. And they were really sad about him, right? If you have a very, you know, so, a very good king, you would cry if he died, right? Because you don't know what will come after. Who would rule you? Is he going to be good? Is he going to be bad? Are we going to get our rights? So shaitan, he came to these people and he said, he came in, in the form of that person. We know that demons, they take the form of different things, right? We're not going to talk about her stories here. But we know that they take the forms of different, different shapes. So he came in the form of that king to, to these people. And he said, hey, I'm your king, and I did not die. Do you know why? So the people were like, whoa, you're alive. How, how did you not die? So he said, yeah, because I'm immortal. I'm a god. And they were pathetic. And they said, oh, you're a god. OK, we're going to worship you. All right? So he said, and you know what? You should build a barrier. And for some reason, they did not question this. <laughs> Any logical person would question this. But they build a barrier because this man is not going to be 24-7 there, right? He's not going to, you know, Iblis has many other priorities he, he wants to do. He's not going to stay for them forever being their king, right? So he built this barrier so they can worship the wall, the statue they built, thinking that he's behind this wall. Fortunately, they did not have the logic enough to think about this for some reason because of sinning. Sinning makes them ignorant. If we sin, we become ignorant. So they worship this uh, wall or whatever, thinking that behind this wall is their god or the king. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a prophet. His name is Hanzala ibn Safwan. This man goes to them, starts speaking logic again, Come on, guys, like, really, you think behind the wall there's a God? Yeah, there's a God behind the wall. Okay, well, take down the wall, go in. No, the God will be very angry. How do you know he's going to be angry? Did he tell you that? Did he verbally tell you that? No, but we're scared, right? Shaitan gives you fear, feeds you with fear. He wants you to fear him. In uh, Surah Al-Jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَزَادُوهُمْ أَرَهَقًا That demons are actually scared of us, humans. But if we fear them, they feed on our fears. So then they manipulate us and provoke us. So shaitan fed them with fear and ignorance. So now they're worshipping a wall and they're scared to take it down because they think there's a God behind this and he's going to take them down and there's literally nobody behind this wall. So he kept telling them, come on, there is no God, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's only one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they said, okay, you know what, we had enough with you. So they grabbed him and threw him in the well and they went down 
They dig the wall, uh, they dig the uh, hole in the, in, in the ground, and they buried him alive. So of course, because he's a prophet, he would be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in this instance, he was protected for a reason, for a moral message. So he had a follower from these people, and this man was actually African. And this guy, he would travel all around, all around, away from Azerbaijan to different cities and countries all around, buy foods and drinks, and then he would secretly go to the well and go down and feed the prophet who was living there peacefully because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting him. Every day, he would, be do this, he would be doing this every day. And because of their doing, they used to have a lot of water in the well. Water stopped from the well. They have no water no more in the well. And their cities, it became abandoned. People would only hear the roars of the lions and you know, the sounds of animals. So eventually, one day, this man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to, you know, that's the moral story of it. So he wanted to take the soul of the Prophet. So the man, one time, when he was going to the well to give him the food and drink, he would sleep, he would take a nap. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would let him sleep for seven years. Then he would wake up, thinking he slept like one hour, right? So he would continue on going. And then he would also take a nap, so another seven years. So he slept a total of 14 years. And then he would reach the well, he would take away the rock, he would see the hole, there's nothing, it's empty. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take the soul of this man. Now, there's a hadith by, narrated by Ibn Jarir that says, this man, because of what he was doing, he's going to be the first person to enter heavens. The first person to enter heavens. So, and that was the story of Ashabul Ras. They are known as Ashabul Ras because in Arabic, Rasaw Nabiyahum Fil Bir. They put their prophet beneath the well. All right, the final story before we dive into the Tree of Nations. Do we know? Yunus, Jana. This is his English name, Jana. Jonah. Yeah, Jonah. <laughs> so Yunus, alayhi salam, or also his um, his nickname, the Nun. Do we know why his name is the Nun? Do we know the letter the letter Nun in Arabic? Do you know actually that each Arabic letter means something? I think we talked about it one time, did we? No, you don't remember? I think when we were talking about Ibrahim. <laughs> but anyways, I'll tell you why, 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 what does it mean. Noon, in the Semitic language, it means al-hut, the fish, or the whale. Al-hut or samaka. Right? So he's called the noon because he's story is all about the well, right? This is one of the miracles of the Quran. Subhanallah. So, okay. This man's story is very simple. Again, we have another nation. This time... Okay, let me try to figure out this. Okay, here. Okay, over here. All right. Iraq has in the north of it a city known as Mosul. Do we know Mosul? Al-Mosul. It is in a province known as Nainawa, or in English, Nainaveh. So there, there were a bunch of another people who were living there. And again, worshipping different kinds of idols, different kind of kinds of gods, imaginary gods. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell Yunus, go and liberate their minds. Liberate their souls from being enslaved with themselves. So, Yunus would start talking to them and speaking to them. Again, with the same logic and arguments of every single prophet. But then, 
Yunus did not have the patience that Shu'aib had, right? So he told them, guys, come on, there's only one God. They'd say, no, we get out of the whatever. So Yunus would say, okay, you know what? Punishment is coming in three days, I'm leaving the city. So he takes all of his stuff and he leaves the city. So I don't know if they hear, heard about other prophets. I think, of course, Yunus told them about other prophets. Every prophet would talk about the previous prophets. So apparently they were like, okay, so this guy, he's not like the other prophets he told us about. The other prophets would remain until the punishment descend. Apparently this guy was told with the punishment, so he left the city. So we think that he's right, the punishment is gonna descend upon us. So the men started crying, the women started crying, and from their cry, the animals started roaring and screaming. And that day, like people say that if you walk by the city of Mosul back, back then, you would hear like sounds coming from the city. Everybody was like, the whole thing was in chaos and everybody was crying. And they started asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And they started saying, okay, we believe in whatever Yunus came with. All right, we, we're believers now, we're Muslims. All right, just no punishment. So Yunus does not know about this. He already sailed and in history, they say he sailed with, uh, into the, or inside the Al-Bahr Al-Akhdar, the Green Sea. What is the Green Sea? We know the, I don't know in English if, if it's called the White Sea. I think it's only in Arabic, right? Al-Bahr Al-Abiyad. Uh, you know the Mediterran Mediterranean Sea? Right, in Arabic, we know it as Al-Bahr Al-Abiyad al mutawasit the White Mediterranean Sea, because it looks white, if, you know, the water looks white. And there's also the Red Sea, right? So what's the Green Sea? The Green Sea, they say it is the Arabian Gulf. The Arabian Gulf is over here, right? Where um, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran is around. And, there, and some said, no, it is actually the Arab, Arab Sea. Arab Sea is the sea surrounded by Arabian Peninsula, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, uh, India. Uh, sorry, Afghanistan does not lie on there, but Pakistan, Pakistan and Iran and India. And some say it's the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the one that, I mean, personally, for me, it makes more, most, the most sense is the Arabian Gulf because it's close, Mosul, right? It's close Nainawa. And there is a place called Shat al-Arab in which the efforts and Tigris, Dijla al-Furat, stops there. It stops at this place. This place lies on the Arabian Gulf. So he sailed through this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, yes, he's a prophet, but he committed a mistake. Why? Because prophets are humans. They're like us. They commit a mistake. So he committed a mistake. He should have not left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tasked you with something. You, you gotta stay there, preach, until they become Muslim, or until the punishment descends upon them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give him a, a listen, a lesson. So he would sail, and then waves would strike the boat that he's in. So the waves would start getting really heavy, so the crew of the ship, they said, if we take one man away from our ship, if we throw one man into the water, our ship is going to settle. So they made a, a, you know, like a heads or tails. Basically in Arabic it's called qura, right? And the choice was on Yunus. So they knew he was a prophet, they, so, so they said, no, 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 we're not gonna throw this man, right? Like probably his people now are being punished, we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna get punished, right? There's enough things coming on us right now. So they did this again, and again, it came on Yunus. So Yunus this time was like, okay, now I know what's coming. So he took off his clothes, his upper clothes, so he can swim and, and throw himself. But they said, no, 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 they insisted. They said, no, let's try this again, right? We're not gonna do this. We don't wanna have any punishment. So they did this again, and again, it came on Yunus. So they were, they were left with no choice. So Yunus threw himself into the water, the sea. So while he was trying to swim, into the shore, a whale came and swallowed him. Now, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach him a lesson. So the well would actually swim into all of the regions of waters all around the world. And while it's swimming, Yunus would hear all the animals saying subhanallah, mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshipping Allah. Because you know, everything around us is worshipping Allah. The chairs, the tables, everything, the fans, everything is actually saying subhanallah. Right? But we don't hear it. So Yunus was given the ability by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hear this. And this would strike him, right? Everything is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even inanimate objects. Even the whale he's inside is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can hear him say subhanallah. So he started saying subhanallah and doing adhkar and praying inside of the well. And he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will take this well as my worshipping place. This is my masjid. This is my uh, an ordinary masjid. And he said, Subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. So he would keep saying on this prayer. So the animals and trees and objects, they would hear somebody say, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. So they would say, Oh Allah, we are hearing somebody that his voice is really far and he's saying those words. Who is this man? So Allah says, Allah tells them, Do you not know this man? They said, We don't. He said, This man is Yunus. Yunus. So they say, Oh, is that Yunus the guy that each day there was a good deed that ascends to you from him? He said, yes, this is Yunus who gets a good deed every day ascending to me. So they said, what, what has happened to him? And Allah told them, now he is in, inside of a whale. In deep water. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. They were the mediators be between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Yunus. So Allah can forgive him and you know, save him from, from the agony he is in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listened to his plea. And he ordered the whale to spit him out. And he spit him on the shore. And there, Yunus was very you know, weak, right? He would not eat healthy for, some said he'd stay, he stayed for three days, some said for weeks, some said for years. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow a pumpkin plant to grow and then it would have pumpkins. So he would eat from these pumpkins. Why pumpkins? Because they're healthy. Pumpkins, you can eat the cover, you can eat the actual fruit, and you can eat the seed. You can eat everything in it, and it's healthy for the body and for the mind. So Yunus kept on eating this, and he recovered fast because of this specific plant. SubhanAllah. And then he would go back to his people, and he would find them that they became Muslims. Now what happened to the well? Does anybody know what happened to the well? That was actually a question I was really curious about when I was a kid. Because wells live for a long time. Do you know what happened to him? He died instantly after he spit out Eunice. Do you know why? He was very sad that the Prophet is not inside him no more. He was very sad because he had this blessing that there's a prophet inside him, right? He's protecting the prophet. So he was really, really, really sad that he died from sadness. SubhanAllah. So this, these are our three stories for the day. And let's conclude now with the tree of nations because I have specific things here. <clears throat> Can we see that? Yes, I'm using ancestry.com. <laughs> What's that? Well, like that, yes. Yeah. All right. Shuaib, we were talking about Shuaib. I, pardon me, he's in Arab, it's in Arabic. Um, this, this tree is still under construction. Um, basically, it's a tree that I constructed that connects every, every nation around the world that we know today to Adam. Um, so 
I did not tell you the ancestry of Shu'aib. Shu'aib is the son of Mikil. Uh, people said he's also Nuwayb or Daifur. It doesn't matter. You know, most people said he's Mikil. He's the son of Yashjar, who is the son of, remember this guy? Madian, right? Who is the son of? Ibrahim and Qattura. So, next time, inshallah, we will talk about Musa alayhi salam. And it would be the, was it the third or the second? I'm not sure, probably the third or the second. Uh, the second lecture of the sub-series of the history of the Israelites. The Israelites are those who are descended from Ishaq alayhi salam, right? Israelis, basically. Not, not Zionist Israelis. Israelis, Israelites. Okay, so Musa alayhi salam married Safura, who is the, the daughter of Shu'aib. So he married the daughter of Shu'aib. And Shu'aib is an Arab. Because the Prophet ﷺ said there were four Arab prophets, uh, Hud, Salih, Shu'aib, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Wait, 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 wait. Wasn't Ismail alayhi salam Arab? Right? You're going to ask me this question. There's a, a, a funny story. I remember we had this in a test before when I was like, I think, 12 years old. And I wrote Nuh and Ismail. And the teacher would mark me down and I said, Wait, Ismail is an Arab prophet, right? right? Like, come on. <laughs> so, Ismail, he's not Arab in the sense of these guys. How? Oh, gosh. So, okay, let's go all, all the way back <laughs> to Adam, alayhi salam. When Adam was created, Allah allamahu kull al-asma, right? He taught him everything, obviously. Because he's going to be alone on earth, right? So he got to know his everything. He got to know everything. But the language he spoke when he was in heavens was Arabic, the, the Arabic of the Quran. Because remember, the Quran was written way back ago, before we were even created. So Arabic existed way back ago. So he would speak Arabic. But then, as a punishment for him, because he sinned, when he was des when he descended into earth, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala let him spoil his tongue when he speak. So he spoke Syriac. Do we know Syriac? I, th I don't think youngsters know that. Syriania. Syriani, right? Um, how, how can I give them an example about that? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, I, th I think we know Palestinians. There are Palestinians and Lebanese and Syrians around here, right? Okay, some of the vocabulary we use is actually Syriac. It's actually Syriania. Right? So it was one of the languages mainly, all right? Uh, they say Isa alayhi salam spoke this language. So he would speak with this language. And then his son Shaith would speak that. And then the children of Shaith would speak that. But then each of these guys would still know Arabic. After Adam alayhi salam repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prayer that he repented with was in Arabic, it was not in Syriac. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him back Arabic, so he can speak Arabic again. So it was kept with the prophets. So Idris alayhi salam, he was the first man in history to write. So when he wrote, he wrote in Arabic, not in the Arabic script, because the Arabic script actually was developed throughout years. It used to look differently. But the Arabic vocabulary, and this is why many languages in the world, you would see Arabic origins in it. Because Arabic is actually the mother of languages. So Idris would write in Arabic, and then the people, when they pick up those writings after him, the civilizations, they would read it in Arabic. And when they scattered all around, they started speaking different dialects. So we had different dialects of Arabic, pretty much like today, right? You have the Syrian dialect, the Iraqi dialect, the Kuwaiti dialect. So we had different dialects. Syriac is a dialect of Arabic. Hebrew is a dialect of Arabic. Uh, Babylonian and Chaldean is a dialect of Arabic. Sumerian is a dialect of Arabic. So Ismail's father, Ibrahim, he spoke 
Chaldean dialect of Arabic. Right? Let me tell you how similar it is. What do we say in Arabic to say hi? Not marhaba. The other one. Salamu alaikum, right? They literally say shlomo alaikho in Chaldean. Very similar. Okay, in Arabic we say ab and im, right? Father, mother. They say ab and im. Same thing. To say and, we say wa, right? We use the letter wa. They say wa. Same thing. Even aw, like or, they say aw. The same thing. And his mother was Egyptian, right? So his, his mother would speak the Egyptian dialect that time, not today. Th that Egyptian dialect, right? So now this guy, Ismail, he was raised with those two dialects. But he was raised in Mecca. And the people who was with them in Mecca were Yemeni tribes who spoke the Southern Arabian dialect of Arabic. And they had um, different letters as well. It's very similar to Phoenician and Amazighi today. So he had three dialects now. So imagine this guy growing up, hearing this word, this word, this word, and that's the wisdom of Allah because he wants to bring back the Arabic of the Quran that was missing. So his native tongue was not actually Arabic. The Arabic of the, the Prophet spoke. But after he combined those three dialects, speaking those three dialects, his tongue started speaking the Arabic that we know. This is why he's not Arab, like the Prophet. Because he spoke Al Arabiya Al Mubina when he was 14. The Arabic of the Quran, the Arabic of the Prophet, of the Shu'aib, of Salih, of Hud, is Al Arabiya Al Mubina, the clear Arabic. But the others are dialects. <clears throat> All right, do we have time? Maybe 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. All right, let's go back to the ancestry tree. Maybe I, oh, that's too far. Okay. Um, since we are gonna talk about, since we're gonna talk about Musa alayhi salam next time, and the history of the Israelites, let's distinguish the Israelites. Let's distinguish these terms first. Israelite, what does an Israelite mean? A descendant of Ishaq, who was the child of Ibrahim. Pretty much like an Ismaili, right? Ishmaelite. Ishmaelite is a descendant of Ismail, who are the Adnanite Arabs, right? Like the Prophet. ﷺ. So anybody who is blood related to Ishaq, his descendant, he is an Israeli. An Israelite. Okay, what is a Jewish? Somebody who follows the religion of Judaism. I have a question. Is every Muslim Arab? No, right? Is every Arab Muslim? No. So is every Israelite a Jew? And is every Jewish an Israelite? No. Because Judaism originally was a religion like Islam, right? It, it was Islam, basically. Inna dina indallahi al-Islam. But then, it was corrupted. After, there's, there's a story. This is why I called this sub-series The History of the Israelites. There's a huge story about how it was corrupted, specifically. We're inshallah gonna talk about it. So, now they spread all around Judaism, the religion, just like Islam. And some other nations became Jews. Now, today, we hear different terms. We hear Ashkenazi Jew, right? Did we hear this word, Ashkenazi Jew, right? We hear Mizrahi Jew. We hear Sefradim Jew. Why is there this difference? What's an Ashkenazi Jew? Somebody who came from Europe. What's a Sifradim Jew? Somebody who came from Spain. Now, what's a Mizrahi Jew? 
That's an Israelite, right there. Some Israelites today are Muslims. They don't know their ancestry. And they're Muslims. The, there were uh, tribes when, in the Medina with the Prophet Sallallahu They were Israelites, descendants of Ishaq. But there was one tribe, I think Bani Nudar, they were not Israelites. They were Yemeni tribes from Al-Azad, from the tribe of Al-Azad from Yemen, who became Jewish. But they're not descendant of Ishaq. So those guys became Jewish, practiced Judaism, right? There was uh, even a, um, a very famous companion. He's, I, I can't remember his name. I think Abdullah ibn Salam. I think that's his name, Abdullah ibn Salam. He's a Jewish. He was a Jewish and an Israelite, but he became Muslim. So anybody who descends from Abdullah ibn Salam is actually an Israelite, but he's a Muslim. So Jewish does not equal you're a descendant of Ishaq. That does not equal that. The Ashkenazi Jews, who are 95%, I think, I think 90, was it 75%? I'm not sure. I think it was either 75% or 95%. But generally, they're the most of the Jews today. These guys, they're, most of them, they're not Israelites. The word Ashkenazi, where does it come from? If you look at the tree, all the way back to... Inshallah, we're going to end with this. We remember the children of Nuh. Sam, Ham, Yafith. Yafith had a bunch of seven, seven people, seven children. He had Aumar, Tayrash, Tawbal, Ma'juj, Wayawan, Wamidai, Wamashah. Right? So there are details to that. Um, I think you can figure out some of the people. Yawan is the ancestor of Greece, right, and Rome. Um, Medai is the ancestor of Persians, Kurds, uh, Pashto, um, Pakistanis, Indians. Mashah, he was the ancestor of the Illyrians, who are the ancestors of the Albanians. That's good, that's a detailed one. And yeah, Ma, uh, Ma Juj, sorry, it's not yet Juj, Ma Juj. Ma Juj is the an ancestor of a bunch of people, right? The ancestor of Ya Juj and Ma Juj, the ancestor of the Turks, the ancestor of the Hungarians, the ancestor of the Finnish, the Finlandian people, the Native Americans, the Mongolians, the Chinese. They scattered all around, they're big, right? And Tobal, I still did not figure it out. I promise you I'll figure it out. Tayrash is the ancestor of the Turwadin, the Thracians, who are the ancestors of the Romanians. Do you know Romania? They're not actually Romans. Romanians, they're different. Aumar, that's where it gets interesting. So he's a father of Ashkenaz and Rifath and Togherma. All right? Now, Togherma is the guy who is the progenitor of all of the Caucasian people. Are the terms getting familiar, familiar? Caucasian, right? What do we mean by Caucasian today? European, but that's wrong. Because a Caucasian is somebody who came from the Caucas, al Caucas. He is a descendant of Togarma. All right? Irish people, do we know the Irish people, right? Red head, right? Black, black head and white face and green or blue eyes, right? Irish people are parts are a part of a nation called the Celts. The Celts, they were the big nation of Europe. They lived in France. They lived in Britain. They lived in Ireland, in Spain. All of this, all of these were Celtic countries. So now comes the interesting part: Ashkenaz. Who is he the ancestor of? Russia. No. Russia is Majush. Yeah. Could you imagine that? They're the cousins of the Turks. Um, Ashkenaz is the ancestor of the Germanics. Not Germany. Germanics. All right. Let's get this in detail. Inshallah, we can conclude and pray. 
Okay. Ashkenaz had a child named Manus. Manus is a god in the Scandinavian uh, mythology. Okay. Oh, right. Thank you for letting me know that. Manus is the child of Ashkenaz. Manus had more? Okay. Manus had... Okay, that's as far as I can get. Manus had three children. He had Estayev, he had Ing, and he had Ermin. Ing gives you a little bit of a hint. Who is he the ancestor of? Ing. No. <laughs> the Chinese are, are the Majuj. Remember? <laughs> English. English. <laughs> Ink, England. Yeah, why is it called what? No, why is it called England? England, the land of the ink. Right? Yeah. So they're a tribe called the ink. They're Germanics. Germanics. They lived in northern Germany and Scandinavia, which is Sweden, Norway, all of these countries. Right? So in the medieval time they decided, you know what, we, we're going to expand. So they started going on the Roman Empire, start fighting the Roman Empire. The Romans said, like, every single nation for them were savages. So, so they said, those northern savages were attacking us. And Julius Caesar said, I'm going to fight those uh, savages that are attacking us. There's this very famous fight. They literally were this close to invade Rome during Julius Caesar, but he crushed them. But they were able to conquer France and take out the Celtics. And there they established the Frankish Empire, but not the Ing. Estayev is the ancestor of Frank, who is the ancestor of the French. Why was it called France? France comes from Frank, who is a big tribe because they were named after Frank, who is the son of Estayev. Now, Ing had different, different people as well, different children. He had Shauk, he had Boranos, Yot, Fris, and Vandal, and he had Sax. Sax is the ancestor of the Saxons, thus these tribes, all these tribes formed an alliance and they were named as the Anglo-Saxons. These tribes, they were part of the Frankish Empire and some of them went and invaded Britain. Now England that we know today is actually a Celtic land. It's not an English land. It does not belong to the Anglo-Saxons. It belongs to the Celtic, but they invaded it. And they did a very familiar scene that we know they massacred the Celtics and they kicked them out of their land and they named this land England. So the Frees are the ancestors of the Pharisians, if we hear about them, the Pharisians. And finally, it's not moving no more. I think, all right. Ermin is the ancestor of no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Armenians, Armenians are Caucasians, remember? So from Togurma. Yeah, their, their ancestor is Hayek. That's his name. Um, they are the ancestors of uh, the Balagoth, the Borgondos, and the um, Sibirios. I'm trying to get the last name. The Longobrados. Now these guys, they are the uh, ancestors of the Visigoths and the Goth Goths generally. Do we know the Goths generally? Goths were um, a civilization who invaded Spain. And they ruled it uh, until the Muslims came over and uh, liberated Spain. And the Long uh, Longarbados, or easier, it's Lombards. They were the ones when Rome fell, conquered northern of Italy. 
and they had a civilization there. Now, what is the main feature of these guys? They are, they have a blonde hair, they have a blue eyes, and they are pale white. This is the misconception that we have. Caucasian does not equal white, right? A white person is somebody who is white in skin, right? I mean, I'm white. A lot of you are white, right? Anybody who's white is white, right? But a blonde with white, pale white and blue eyes, this man is a Germanic. He descends from Ashkenaz. He's an Ashkenazi. So what's the pattern here? Some of the Germanic tribes converted to Judaism in the medieval times after they were taken out from the Khazar land when the Slavs conquered the Khazars. They lived in Germany. They converted to Judaism. They lived in this land for years. And then these guys are called the Ashkenazi Jews. So is this clear? So the history of the Israelites, now we're talking about the, the actual Israelites, the actual descendants of Ishaq. We're not talking about the Ashkenazi Jews, neither the Safradim. The Safradim, they're also Visigoths who converted to Judaism, lived in Spain. So inshallah, is that clear? Is, are the terms clear inshallah? Yes, any questions? Well, Ishaq is the father of Yaqub. Okay. Yeah, but good clarification. Yaqub's name is Israel. This is why they're called Israel. Excuse me. <coughs> so the reason why, why they say specifically Israel, because ya, uh, Ishaq had another child, a twin brother to Yaqub. His name is Al-Ais. And he is the ancestor of Al-Mu'abiyin in Jordan. And he he's one of his ancestors. His descendants, his name is Rum, and he traveled to where the Roman Empire was, and his descendants mixed with the Romans. So some of the Romans actually descend from Ibrahim. Some of the Greek and Romans, some of them, little of them, descend from Ibrahim. Not Alexander the Great or those guys, you know, Aflaton or Socrat. No, those actually are Greek. They descend from Yawan. But... Some some descends from Elias. This is why they say Banu Yaqub, not Banu Ishaq generally. Yeah, but these guys merge now. So, mm -hmm. any other questions? Inshallah. No more questions. Okay, so Inshallah, uh, that's it for today. Next time, Inshallah, we're gonna talk about Musa. Very exciting. It's gonna be very long. I'm just gonna tell you from now. We're going to have a couple of series about it because the story of Musa is very long. So let's do dua, inshallah. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa barik lana fi ma aatayt. Wa qina wa srif anna sharr wa ma qadayt. Inna ka taqadhi bil haqqi wa innahu la yuqadha alayk. Wa innahu la yadhillu man walayt. Wa la ya'izzu man aadayt. Tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashyatika ma tahulu bihi baynana wa bayna ma'asiyatik. ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا أبدا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خيرا Make dua for us inshallah and for all the Muslims